the safety of the people. I think the American government has the right to do whatever. There's laws in place they need to be enforced. Every year, my insurance payments, my premiums go up. Something's got to be done because there's a lot of people running around without health care. Obviously, there's a lot of debate as to whether illegal aliens are a positive influence on this economy. It's hard for us to afford everything the way it is and then for us to have all kinds of other people to support. But we are a country of the free, and so I think we have to be very open-minded. I just think proper education, learning the right things. When I look on television and I see three separate shooting incidents, I think they need to get tough with it. Straighten out the politicians. Keep to their word, and to be honest, I think that's important. They, they make a lot of decisions which sort of impact my life, impact the children's lives. I think it's an obligation to, to vote. I think we, need, we all need to, to do that. Welcome everyone, I'm Tom Overlake. KSNQ in partnership with KTTC is very pleased to present to you Election 2006, a series of conversations designed to aid you in voting in November. Our coverage represents a sampling of key races from throughout this region and it is KSMQ's plan to continue to build upon this very important service by providing even more opportunities to get to know and to understand the issues at hand and of course the people who represent you in Washington and St. Paul, your region and your hometown. So we are joined today by Democrat incumbent Senator Dan Sparks and his Republican opponent, Mr. George Marine, both who are vying to represent you as a state senator in District 27. I'll be asking questions compiled by our internal election team and most importantly questions submitted by you, the voters. Neither of the candidates has been provided with the questions beforehand, so let's start with health care. Gentlemen, it seems to be on everyone's mind as we discussed just a few moments ago. George, let's, uh, let's begin with you. What is the big issue with health care? Uh, for example, should a universal health care be something that uh, we should have in Minnesota? Great question. I don't agree with uh, universal health care. Uh, we've knocked over 23,000 doors and we've had people on both sides of that opinion. But uh, speaking with a trucker uh, in Wyckoff one day told me, he said, George, he said, I really liked the idea of universal health care until I began to speak with other business people and truckers from uh, Canada. And he said, the, the thing that I dislike the most about it, and uh, these were his comments exactly, he said, Everybody gets coverage, but the government rations that coverage out. And number two, it, uh, uh, it chooses who gets coverage. And sometimes that coverage is 300 to 400 miles away. So number one, I don't like universal health coverage so for that. So what is the solution then? The solution is, number one, empowering our people to be able to provide affordable health care. And uh, there are some mandates that are on the, the uh, that are legislated by our, our government here in the state that has certain mandates. And I think we need a pilot series of mandate-free health care coverage. There's the cost of coverage and there's the provision uh, for coverage. And so in order to keep those costs down, we need, compet we need competition and we need to lift the regulations to allow um, companies from other states to be able to operate here in Minnesota and provide health coverage for our, our uh, constituents. And then we need to, I think, eliminate things like the port wine elimination, um, uh, toupees and uh, this Bosley type treatment okay. that don't necessarily have to be in health care coverage. Uh, that are and it shoots, to it one's health. Exactly, <laughs> and it shoots the cost up yeah. enormously. Dan, your thoughts on, on universal health care? Well, certainly health care is a huge issue, and I think that universal health care has been discussed in the Minnesota Senate, although there's a large price tag that goes along with it. So I think that there's other things that we can do that would be better. Uh, similar to my opponent, I had a, a conversation in Albert Lee the other day with a woman who worked full-time, her husband worked full-time, they had two children, their youngest son had asthma, and they're basically going broke because they can't afford the insurance to get the inhaler. So we're at a crisis point. I think that uh, I was able to do some things for small business to allow them to have some flexibility in their plans. In fact, I won an award for the guardian of small business. I think that we can look at pooling our resources together. We take and put more numbers and spread the risk over bigger areas. We're able to drive premiums down. And again, I think uh, as a member of the Commerce Committee, one thing we can do is look at competition. In the state of Minnesota, we have two or three large carriers. If you look at other states around us, 
there's a lot more competition. That tends to drive the, uh, the prices of the premiums of insurance down as well. Why is it taking so long to resolve this issue? Why is it getting to that point where families can't afford the inhalers for their children? I mean, it's, it's 2006. Why is this taking so long, Dan? Well, it certainly shouldn't. I think that I offered legislation also. We looked at some of the HMOs and we wanted to have them be accountable. You know, when you look at some of these CEOs receiving $90 billion or $90 million, excuse me, um, bonuses, right. obviously something wrong with our system. We need to make sure that we reform it, get those dollars down to the bedsides where they really can be helpful. And again, you know, when seniors are on fixed incomes and have to struggle with paying for their prescription drugs or their food, something is definitely wrong and we need to make some drastic steps to change it. And so what's taking so long to reform these laws in your opinion, George? That's a good idea and, and I, I'm a big fan of and, and proponent of uh, our legislators being accountable to our people. We can't have any more of this business of politicians being accountable to politicians. You pat my back, I'll pat your back. You vote for my, my legislation, I'll support yours. We need true accountabilities from our public servants to the people. The people are demanding this and we need to put up. Let's move on to uh, prescription drug affordability for our senior citizens. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we have a, a growing number of, of elderly and throughout southern Minnesota. Mm -hmm. How do we address this issue? And Dan, let's start with you. Well, I think that we took some good first steps. I know during the last four years, we've worked hard to allow some of the drugs to be imported from Canada. Obviously, there's some issues with safety that we have to be concerned of. But obviously, when there's other states and other countries that are allowing uh, prescription drugs to be at a lower price, mm -hmm. that's something that we need to really look at. And again, like I said, it's unfortunate, it's not acceptable that you know seniors have to try to decide whether or not they're going to have their meals or afford their prescription drugs. So we've taken some good first steps and I think we need to continue but to do that. But is going to Canada really a solution to get these prescription drugs? Well, I mean, it, Right. I don't know if it's a solution. Again, I think we need to look at um, how our whole system works. And you see, you know, if you watch the TV news or you watch commercials at right. night and we see when people are advertising for certain drugs, obviously someone has to pay for that and there's a cost factor that goes into that as well. So I think we really need to look at how we can, uh, you know, use generic drugs versus some name brand drugs, make sure that we make it affordable, drive those prices down so the average person can afford those prescription drugs. Okay. People want solutions and people want to believe in a senator that is going to find solutions. Right over by the, um, by the fairgrounds in Austin, I was knocking doors during the fair, met a lady that was in that same exact situation. She was having to decide from eating or taking her prescription drugs. Just that day, I had a real godsend, I feel. I had a friend of ours from Albert Lee that called me and said, George, I, I am a pharmaceutical representative. Here is some information that you can get to your voters while you're going door to door where we can provide drugs free of charge or at a reduced uh, rate for the seniors. And I had that information. I went back and knocked on that precious lady's door and, and she was thrilled because she had somebody that was looking for solutions for her. So there, there are more options out there than just uh, bringing in drugs from, from Canada. We need people that have real solutions and that are going to work hard to find those solutions. Mr. Marine, as a, a reverend, mm -hmm. how will you balance the powers of church and state in your life if you are elected to office? Okay. I'm a third generation pastor and uh, uh, had an excellent uh, mentor in my father. Uh, my father's a Korean era veteran. He is also a, uh, well, just recently retired as a pastor. And uh, my father was a very, very patriotic man. He taught me to love this country, that it was the greatest nation on the face of the earth, even to be willing to die for the principles upon which this country was founded. And that's very important to me, and I stress that with our children, with our congregation. Uh, maybe some people don't know, but my wife is also a minister. And so her and I pastor our church that we have founded, Grace Christian Church in Albert Lee. It's all public service to us, whether it's ministry or whether it's politics. And I think that's what uh, uh, many of the people that we have met in knocking over 23,000 doors have been very welcoming of that concept. Of course, we have the separation of church and state, but uh, Senator Sparks, how strong an influence should the church have in our government? We have a lot of uh, religious, Christian, or other, other type of re uh, religions. 
how do we separate that? Well, I think it's something that we have to look at very carefully. And obviously, our forefathers had a very uh, insight, and our Constitution has served us quite well. You know, we're currently in a war in Iraq. Um, people are fighting for our very freedoms, and one of those freedoms is the freedom of religion. So certainly, I would never want to take that right away. I think everyone has the right to worship any way they want, but I think that we have to be very careful that there's a separation of church and state and that government plays its roles. I think most people want government that provides good schools, good roads, affordable health care, and takes care of our environment. I think that's the role of government. Do you find that sometimes uh, with the role of religion in government, you start to, there are social issues, for example, that kind of can get divisive in our state. Um, how do you deal with that, for example? Well, I think, again, and it goes back to some of these socially divisive issues that instead of be going up to St. Paul, obviously being a strong voice for the people locally and trying to focus on, like I said, the things that the Constitution, the state of Minnesota requires us to do fully fund public education, take care of our transportation system. Those are the roles of government, certainly, that I believe. Obviously, there's a separation between the two powers, and it served us quite well. Okay, do you have a, a quick uh, question? Yes, on? yes. My opponent and I, I believe, differ greatly on this. Uh, at, a, at a minister's meeting that we hosted right here in the city of Austin, uh, our present senator came and spoke with us. We were, we were considering uh, his voting record on the marriage amendment, the proposed marriage amendment. And our senator really, really disturbed me and many of the ministers that were there. There were about 20 to 25 ministers. And he brought up the point, what if the marriage amendment comes up and we tack onto it an amendment that says we are going to begin to tax churches? Now, in this great country, our churches, regardless of what denomination it is, are property tax exempt. Mm -hmm. Now, that was very, very bothering to me. and. Uh, and it's, it's interesting to me that my opponent invokes separation of church and state when it seems convenient for him, and yet in some of his most recent literature, he had a member of the clergy endorsing him right on his literature. So I, I'm not sure our senator knows where to take that stand. I, I but what believe about when people come to you and say, but you are a reverend, how do, you know, and again, this goes back to my he, other question, how do you that. separate here's the really way I answer between that. church and state? The founders of our nation were Christian, Bible-believing, right. praying men of God. They came to this country to escape a state church, a state run, a state endorsed, a state um, supported church. They came here not for the freedom from religion, they came here for the freedom of religion. Okay. And so 24 of the original 55 signers of our, of our American uh, documents were ordained seminary trained pastors. So those are the Christian principles that this country was founded on. Okay. Those are the principles that I stand up strongly for. So Dan, I want to give you a chance to respond. Well, certainly I think that it's easy to pull certain sound bites. And there are certain things that I would never do to win an election. I've ran a clean election in 2002, and to this point I've ran a clean election. Um, my opponent wants to talk about one issue and one issue only. I met three times, it's true, with these pastors. and It's easy to pull a certain sound bite out, certainly. Um, I'll tell you what I've told people over and over regarding the marriage amendment. I believe that marriage is between one man and one woman. I believe also that we have some of the strongest laws in the nation, the 1997 Defense of Marriage Act that states in there that in order to be recognized in the state of Minnesota, marriage must be between one man and one woman. We've had a court challenge that stood up. We don't have activist judges in this state. Our judges are appointed. In 2002, we talked about this socially divisive issue. There were zero same-sex marriages recognized in 2002. And as we sit here today, there are zero marriages zero same-sex marriages recognized in the state of Minnesota. So my point is, we have a law in the books that already says the speed limit is 55 miles an hour. Do we need to pass another law that says the speed limit is 55 miles an hour? Or should we focus on education, health care, the other issues that are really important to people here in the district? Okay. Um, so let's move on to some of the other sure. big issues then. Um, actually, at this time, I want to give you an opportunity to ask your opponent a question in this segment we're calling Peer to Peer. And sure. actually, I'm going to begin with you, Dan. Okay. I would like to stick with the same question because it seems to sure. be a big issue. And I know that, uh, you know, I think it's unfortunate, certainly, when we have voters that vote on a single issue. We go to St. Paul and we deal with many complex issues. And I think here we have a candidate that's really been focused on one major issue. And so my question from my opponent would be, um, after our first debate at the Good Samaritan uh, Center in Albert Lee, um, my opponent was quoted on the TV as saying that he does not believe in the separation of church and state. And so my question for him today was be, is, would that still be your belief? Okay, George, respond. I'm glad uh, Dan Sparks brought that soundbite issue. Uh, it was said by one of the former speakers of the House that all politics are local. 
I think in this modern age that we live in with technology and sound bites, MP3 players, high uh, definition television, politics is about sound bites. And my opponent has pulled out that sound bite that I don't believe in the separation of church and state. If we could have had the entire uh, luxury to hear my, my response to Donnie Rolls with KAAL TV, you would have heard me say, in fact, this part was on there. It said, I don't believe in the separation of church and state. I believe that's a huge misnomer and it's been blown out of proportion. We've got to go back to the original founders and to our original documents and what their intent was. Their intent was not to be separated from God. Their intent was to have a republic that was based on God's word. They were readers of the Bible. They were men of prayer. They were worshipers of God. And again, they came here for the freedom of religion, not freedom from religion. But today, and so but today we have a very diverse population. Not everybody agrees, perhaps, with your religious principles. How do you represent that population of people who do not perhaps agree with your religious okay. viewpoint? They, they may not agree with my particular Christian values, but this is America, and, and so we will fight for the freedoms of all American citizens. Okay. And uh, clearly, we, we don't uh, uh, bash anybody because they're non-Christian. Um, we just don't do that. We are, we are tolerant people but we believe in Jehovah God, okay. the God of the Bible, and we take our position strongly. I want to that. give you an opportunity now to ask your opponent a question. Okay. I want to know why, uh, Dan, were you so afraid to allow the people of this district to vote on the marriage amendment? You voted against it several times, even though uh, admitting to receiving thousands of communications that this is what they wanted. All they simply wanted was the right to vote. Great question, and again, I'll, uh, I'll respond, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Again, I've had several discussions, and I think I've never voted once for or against it. We voted to pull it out of a conference committee, and again, we have certain rules and protocol in the Minnesota Senate, and I would, again, stand by that. I'll repeat it again. I think it's unfortunate that we have to take time during this very important debate right. when people can ask questions about other issues, but again, I will state okay. my position over and over again that I believe marriage is between one man and one woman, Again, we have some of the toughest laws in the nation, the Defense of Marriage Act that was passed in 1997 that states marriage between one man and one woman. We've had a court challenge, it stands. I would think also um, if, uh, if my opponent has conducted any marriage ceremonies recently, right on the actual marriage application, it states, and they sign it under oath, both parties, that the groom is a male and the bride is a female. So again, I think it's unfortunate that we have to continue to do this. Right. It's a socially divisive issue that we're trying to move away from. We're trying to build coalitions to go and make things stronger in St. Paul, and that's my position on that. And, and so, and actually, no, something. actually, I want to, I okay. want to move on because you, you're right. I, I, this is, we have a lot of issues sure. here that we want to tackle on, but I wanted okay. to give you an opportunity to ask each other questions. So now I get to ask you a question, uh, Dan. Immigration, this is a big issue um, in southern Minnesota. Um, how big of an issue is it, and what do we do about illegal immigrants or undocumented workers, Dan? Very big issue locally, and we've been working for the last four years to try to get our arms around it. It's a big sure. issue that we need to really look into. I've worked locally with a lot of the health and human service folks to try to understand how what we can do. I've worked with our local county attorneys. And here's what I think we can do about it, and here's my plan. Certainly, it's the, some of the issues are federal government, and while I think some of the Border Patrol or the border control ideas that they're putting in place now, building a wall or something that is going to be some positive steps, it might be a little bit too late in, in, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I think locally what we can do, and uh, we've tried this before, I tried to draft an amendment at the state legislature that would have been similar to some legislation that was in Arizona that would not allow illegal or undocumented aliens to re receive certain services, however it was found to be unconstitutional. So my new plan is to have some corporate accountability. And I think what we do is we enforce our current plans we go after the employers that knowingly or willingly hire undocumented or illegal aliens, and we find them, and we find them at such a rate that it's really going to make a difference. I would say five or $10,000 so that we can really uh, start to make some inroads in this uh, area. But from people that I talk to in stories, because I've done many stories on this issue at KTTC, is why is this taking so long again? It's 2006. Mm -hmm. We've been dealing with this issue for a couple of years, and as a state lawmaker, 
why hasn't this been dealt with? Well, again, and I, and I don't want to try to, to play the shell game and push it back and forth. Some of it is a federal issue, and certainly there are certain right. things we can but do on the, the state level. level right. On the local level, I think that we can do some of those things. Again, you, that we need to make sure that we look at some corporate accountability. Going it's a public the safety issue. Businesses certainly. that are hiring them. Or hiring them knowingly, give them a certain time frame. Once we find out they're there, then we start to find them too. But it does get to be a public safety issue because there's certain fire and police that have the right to know who's there, who they actually say are there. And then it gets to be a bill that I passed this last legislative session dealing with identity theft. We had a gentleman in Los Angeles that was a policeman and actually had his right to carry a gun taken away because his identity had been stolen. He's never set foot in Minnesota or the city of Austin. Mm -hmm. However, there was a DWI with his name on it in the city of Austin. So it's a real issue. Again, I think we need to get real aggressive and make some major moves in that area. Okay. Uh, George, I know that you, you mm -hmm. talked to a constituent and that was number two on the, on the top three of Absolutely. important issues. Uh, again, we've knocked 23,000 doors and this is the number two issue in this district. My opponent is playing a shell game with the voters of District 27. Let me call it for what it is. My opponent talks about uh, corporate accountability. In my opinion, it is absolutely hypocritical to talk about corporate accountability and that you're going to go after the companies that are hiring illegal aliens doing it knowingly. When my opponent five times has voted for the Minnesota Dream Act, which in my opinion, it's wrong legislation. It's a wrong policy. It's a wrong way to go about providing public policy for our district because it is legislation that encourages people to break the law. So as leadership, so goes the organization. So here we have a senator that is willing and ready to vote for legislation that encourages people to cross the border illegally and then he's going to go after corporate accountability. That doesn't make any sense to me. Okay. I want to give you 30 seconds to respond and then we're going to move on to another issue. Certainly, Tom, and I think that that's important. I think, once again, my opponent misrepresents my voting record. Obviously, he's been in the Senate. He would understand how this works. I'd be glad to provide you or my opponent um, the, uh, the actual roll calls on the Senate floor where I voted against the okay. DREAM Act. Um, in the end, I did vote for it once because it had over $5 million for the building that we're sitting in right now for Riverland Community College, an omnibus uh, bill, higher education bill. So uh, let's move on to business and economic development, of course, uh, encouraging local business growth and the stability of local businesses um, in your district. How will you go about to do that, George? First of all, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that question. Senator Sparks said five times he voted for the DREAM Act, three times he voted against it. There's a game that can be played when okay. you know you can vote against it and still make yourself look good. So, on, so let's on go to on the to economy. economic yes, development. Yes. yes. There, okay. Um, and, and again, you know, our, our record that we have for our legislators and our public officials is the report card. Just like my kids bring home a report card, just like I brought home a report card when I went to school, Senator Sparks' voting record is the report card that we need to show to the voters of District 27. The biggest job mechanism, creation mechanism, in Freeborn County, which is where I live, $50 million of capital investment has been the Job Z program. Mm -hmm. That's been the driving force. My opponent voted against it. That doesn't make any sense to me. He's, uh, he's a member of the I-90 corridor group, and yet he voted against the mechanism that has brought the most jobs to Albert Lee in Freeborn County. That doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, Dan. Once again, not true. My opponent continues to attack. I've been very supportive of the Job Z legislation. I think locally, certainly in Freeborn County, we're a leader in the whole, uh, in the entire state. It's a program that's had several attacks on it by Metro legislators that don't think it's important. So I don't think that I would receive uh, endorsements by certain business groups. I don't think I would receive the guardian of small business if I was really doing that. I think we need to promote economic development here, certainly locally. The Job Z program has been one thing we've been able to do with. Again, my uh, opponent talked about the I-90 coalition which is a wonderful coalition um, that's made up of uh, not only senators but representatives, Democrats, Republicans, independents, all the way from Wisconsin to the South Dakota border. And what we've done is we've come across party lines trying to find things. We were very successful during the last section. We're going to move forward again and do a lot of wonderful things with that group. I think what I'm hearing from a lot of people in this campaign season especially is uh, this divisive and so I'm curious to know, give me an example, Dan, of how you have crossed the aisle and, 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 and 
pushed and promoted some bipartisan efforts. Well, I think, and we just talked about it, I think that that I-90 coalition is a wonderful, uh, is a wonderful group that we started uh, here recently. In fact, we just met uh, the other day, we had meetings in Worthington, Albert Lee, and we ended up in Rochester. Again, I was fortunate enough to co-chair that because I think it is that important. I think certainly we have to look at, a lot of times it's not Democrat versus Republican, it's Metro versus rural issues. And so I think that we can work together like that. We really can build a coalition. Together we can have a strong voice and do a lot of things that will be wonderful for Southern Minnesota. Okay, George. Okay, give me the question. Um, yeah, how would you work to really cross the aisle and, uh, and, and uh, find solutions rather than issues that divide us as okay. a state? Being a member of the city council for six years now, uh, at the local level, you don't have to um, uh, say what your party affiliation is. You are forced to work together. You're brought together with other counselors from uh, different uh, ways of life, maybe different uh, religious backgrounds, different financial backgrounds. So we are forced to have that opportunity. And I've worked very well with the council in Albert Lee, with our economic development agency, to help promote uh, the programs that would bring jobs. I think the reality of bringing in these huge companies, which our constituents would love to see, I'm not sure we're going to see that happen. But we need to focus on local, homegrown uh, companies that will, that will uh, provide smaller amounts of jobs, but will continue to grow. And the more emphasis that we can put on those uh, smaller companies growing and multiplying, the better off we'll be. Because the chances of those companies sticking around is going to be far better. I can believe already almost a half an hour has passed. I want to encourage our viewers to find out more information on these candidates by checking out their websites. I, I wish you all the best as you continue in this final chapter of the campaign. November 7th, of course, is Election Day, and so we appreciate you joining us Thank today you very in much. this Thank conversation. You. Uh, you know, voting is, of course, one of the key ways you have for staying actively involved in the decision-making process in this country. So we encourage you to get out, exercise this right, and privilege. Election Day, November 7th, and there is more great programming coming up on KSMQ. For KSMQ and KTTC, I'm Tom Overlay. So now, on Election Day, where will you be on November 7th? Uh, typically, we move back and forth between Albert and we try to see some of the folks there and then come back to Austin as well. Okay.